back of the chapel for any donations which are gratefully received. Also, masks. As you all know from a couple of days ago, uh, uh, the government changed the rules regarding masks, and if you uh, go to a supermarket to, or to a shop, it's now compulsory to wear a mask. That isn't the case for uh, places of worship at the moment. Well, I wouldn't be at all sh surprised if that didn't change in the near future, but at the moment it isn't. But you are able to wear a mask if you so wish. So I, you might notice one of the elders in this, uh, this morning who is wearing a mask. And anybody who wishes to come along and wear a mask, they are most welcome to do so. Any other notices? No. Then I'll hand over to Edie. <laughs>
I think it'd be good to, to now say the words of Psalm 8 together as we get to the uh, meat of the service, so to speak. It's good to concentrate on our Lord and uh, his relationship to us across the years. So Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens through the praise of children and infants. You have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the works of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now I'm going to ask him to pray after to come and lead us in prayer. Thank you, Paul. Uh, just before uh, we come to pray, just wanted to say another little thing on masks. Uh, as you know, uh, it's not obligatory to wear a mask coming to chapel, but it is possible is one of the reasons why I'm wearing one now as well. So if uh, you haven't been coming along physically to the chapel because you're a bit worried, you can come and wear a mask if you wish to. But I'm also uh, heard something very interesting on the radio, something we don't hear too much about, that actually wearing a mask is a bit like giving blood. It's not something you do for your own benefit, it's something you do for the benefit of other people. And uh, because this week, uh, Ashley and I, as most of you know, we've been away on holiday on the Suffolk coast, uh, that means we've been uh, seeing and mixing with uh, lots of other people, uh, generally at a good social distance, but we have been in shops, yes. Uh, we've been in cafes, uh, we've been in restaurants, uh, which we wouldn't uh, normally have done, certainly not for the last uh, four or five months or however long it's been. Uh, so we thought, uh, let's uh, wear masks today, see how it goes. Uh, so far I've found that it is possible, I think you can hear me through the mask, which is good. Uh, I have taken my glasses off, though, because they were steaming up. Uh, fortunately, I can see. I'm not sure if uh, the same might be true for, uh, for all of us here. But uh, if, you, if you feel uh, that you'd like to wear a mask, please feel free to do so. Uh, if you want to protect others because you are not sure, uh, then you can do that as well. Uh, just to be clear, uh, neither Ashley nor I have any of the symptoms of COVID, and uh, we very much hope and pray that uh, with the, the distancing measures that were very nicely in place in Suffolk, that that will have been the case. However, masks are optional. Uh, so uh, we're going to come now to pray, and I will be praying about holidays. Uh, we'll be praying a little bit about uh, our, our church as well, as we gather in many ways this morning, both, uh, both here uh, and online. So let's come now before our, our God in prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for the summer. Uh, we thank you that indeed uh, the weather has been generally pretty good for the last few months and that that has helped us to be able to endure the time of lockdown uh, in some better weather and in our gardens or outside. And we thank you that with the, uh, with the proper holiday season here now that uh, some of us at least have the opportunity to go away on, on holiday. We pray for wisdom for those who might be planning that and might be considering where to go. We pray that uh, uh, you'd help each of us to make good and sensible decisions about uh, where to go on holiday and what to do. We pray, for, of course, for safe travel and for safety from the virus itself. We think of all the children, Lord, who are also now uh, finished their, uh, their homeschooling uh, for, the, for the term. And we pray that uh, you'd help them to enjoy their uh, time of, uh, of relaxation and fun over the holidays. And we pray for their parents that you would help them to be able to keep them occupied uh, uh, well during this time. We pray that those children too would be kept safe in their bubbles or in their friendship groups too. And we think particularly of uh, Joshua and Ransom and Naomi uh, who are over in America on their holidays at the moment. We thank you that they have had the possibility to do that uh, because it was postponed from 
Easter or whenever. We pray that they would be having a, a great time there with the, their family and friends over in America. And pray, of course, that you would keep them safe and bring them back safely to us uh, at the end of next week. And we just pray that, uh, that they would have a, a blessed time over there. We want to pray too, Father, for our missionaries that we support in this church. We think of the, the Carter family, Andrew, who used to be our minister here some years ago. Uh, we pray for their plans to move to Thailand uh, shortly. We pray that uh, those plans would be put in place properly and that uh, you would oversee all the details of their travel and their visas and finding a house and a car and all these practical things. We pray too that you'd help them to get uh, uh, sorted out here the different things that they want to tidy up before they go. We pray, Father, for Julie and for her sister in particular as they, they mourn the passing of their mother. And we thank you, though, that, uh, that uh, Julie and her family were able to, to be with her uh, and to be able to spend time with, uh, with Barbara before she passed away. And we pray that you would help them to uh, provide or to, to find suitable accommodation for, for Gareth, uh, uh, her stepfather, uh, that uh, he would, uh, he would have, uh, have a home which is suitable for him and with his various disabilities. And we think of them as they move to a different culture and a different environment, and we pray that you would help the children to make the adjustment that's necessary to get into that, uh, that different culture. And of course, we pray that you would bless their ministry out there, that they would be uh, able to uh, help and encourage both the local church and those who serve as missionaries in that country. We think too of our other friends that we know who are serving in North Africa. We'll call them John and Mary, but that's not their names. We pray, Father, that you would be with them as they've uh, traveled back to the UK to get new visas, uh, help them as they quarantine in Auspice for uh, the next week or two. Uh, we pray that uh, that would be a, a blessed time, even though they're somewhat in uh, technical isolation as well as in, uh, in physical isolation. And we pray that once that time is over, that you would provide for them the accommodation that they need in the Midlands and that you would bless them and their family, especially those little girls, that uh, they would be able to make that adjustment to uh, seeing people again here. And we ask, of course, that uh, they would uh, be successful in getting their visas to return to North Africa and to serve you there. And we pray that you would help them to be able to continue in some way to have uh, uh, remote relationships with uh, some of the people that they've been meeting and they've been befriending and they've been sharing your word with uh, over there. And indeed, we thank you that through this, uh, this COVID crisis uh, throughout the world that people are used to communicating perhaps a bit more deeply than would otherwise be the case uh, while being remote from one another. And we pray that that would be uh, true in their ministry, that you would help them to, to serve the people in, in North Africa, even when they're back here. We think of our own ministry, Lord. We think, thank you that we have the opportunity to, uh, to gather here in this place. Uh, we thank you that we have a, a good building that's well ventilated and that uh, feels quite safe to be in. And we thank you that, uh, uh, that we, we are allowed to gather, uh, although we do more than the fact that we can't lift our voices and worship to you and pray that we would find some way before too long of being able to, to do that in a, in a safe way. We think of those two who are joining us uh, online. We pray that, uh, that you bless them as they join from their homes or from wherever they are, uh, that they would also know a sense of, uh, of fellowship with you. And we pray also for those who are somewhat left behind by technology, who are unable to, to join or to take part in any way. And we pray that, uh, that you would be especially close to them. And we just ask that our, our fellowship, uh, each one of us, would be able to uh, to, to, to share some time and some messages with each other, whether it's by phone or video or in person, uh, that uh, you would bind this, uh, this fellowship together and help us all to, to know together your grace. We pray for our witness, for our outreach. We pray that uh, you would soften hearts around us to your message, that you would challenge them and their attitudes of, uh, of individualism and selfishness so, so often. Uh, and pray that you would help us to present clearly your message. And so we pray for the rest of the service. We pray that uh, you'd have been with Joshua as he has prepared the message that we will hear in a few minutes' time. We pray that you would speak through him and through your word, uh, that you would indeed challenge our hearts and help us to, uh, to respond to you through your spirit, in whose name or in whom we pray. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 31, 
I shall just read it. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant that I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Now I've got to ask Kim Chapel to come and uh, read today's passage from John. Okay, um, this week's reading is John 2 verses 1 to 12, where Jesus turns the water into wine. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more, no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realise where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone, bring out, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Whilst Jesus did hearing, what, sorry, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. Hey, all right, all right. So I've been looking forward to this particular sermon because why instead of coffee, which I normally have, you see me up here drinking uh, chugging black coffee. Uh, this week we are going with wine, and I have a nice uh, Chianti here. Chianti is one of my more favorite type of wines. I also like Shiraz. Just something to pray about in case if any of you are thinking of getting your pastor anything nice for a surprise for a birthday or anything. Not that any of you really are. If you're just in case you're watching my video. But just in case, Shianta Shiraz, awesome. Uh, the reason I'm drinking wine, and we have wine up here, is because we're going to be talking all about wine. This, uh, th th this miracle here in John chapter 2, Jesus turns water into wine. It is a famous story. Uh, people talk about it a lot. They reference it a lot. Uh, it's, it's a big story, particularly at weddings. But what does it mean? What does it mean? They, Jesus turned water into wine. Woohoo! Three cheers for Jesus. Uh, sounds like a, a great party trick. Uh, we wish we could do that very often. It would save us a lot of money because they tax the heck out of alcohol here in the UK. Um, but what does it mean? What does it mean? Why did John, who was gathering all these eyewitness accounts to tell people about Jesus, after he had gathered all his material, why did he feel that this story of turning water into wine was so important? Because we know we left a lot of stuff out. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all three of them gathered a, did a ton of research, brought together all the eyewitness accounts, and then they chose what was going to fit 
inside of their scroll. Scrolls back then were only but so long. And that's why Matthew, Mark, uh, or rather Matthew, Luke, and John are all roughly the same size. They're, they're about as long as a Greco-Roman scroll could possibly be. Mark's is a little bit shorter. But these, so these things had their limits if they're going to fit in one scroll and all of them had to condense. Uh, Matthew and Luke are, are a little bit similar. They have quite a lot of overlapping material. Luke has some unique teachings, so does Matthew, but there's a lot of overlap. And then John, he chose stuff that was very unique. And one of the unique things that John picked, to put it at the very beginning, where in John chapter 2 was a story of turning water into a very nice wine. It begins... Chapter 2, verse 1, by saying, On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. All right, so uh, let's clear, clear up some things. First of all, weddings in the ancient Near East were very different than our weddings. Here in the UK, here in Britain, we are very... Um, modest, we are very reserved, we are very mild in how we celebrate. Now, if you, maybe you've been to a wedding and said, hey, I went to a great wedding and it you know, kind of lasted all day and there's a tremendous meal. Great, we probably enjoyed it, but you know, out there in the Middle East, it, it didn't just last for a day, it just didn't last for a weekend. These things would last for a week, a full week of dancing and of drinking and of feasting. It was, it was an incredible event. And for the bride and the groom, it was for one week, they were treated like absolute royalty by the whole community. Um, we're used to, you know, a bride and groom having a ceremony, and then they kind of go off and have a private honeymoon, just the two of them. Well, here, they would get married at the beginning, and then they'd go back to the house that the groom, that the bridegroom had sort of prepared, and that was like their paradise castle. Uh, but it, it wasn't quite as private as our honeymoons because people would keep bringing them gifts. People would knock on the door and bring them food. They would bring them wine. They, they would just lavish treasure on them. And for one week, the entire community had to treat them uh, like a king and queen. It, it was that big a deal, and this wedding, you know, for many, for the majority of the people who, who lived in a lot of poverty, who didn't have, who weren't particularly well-to-do, this would be like the highlight of their lives, almost. You know, this would, there would be nothing greater, really, than this, this lavish week of celebration. And who do they invite? Well, they invite Jesus. Well, th that... For some of you who are maybe just checking out the Christian faith, just getting to know about Jesus, that might be a bit of a surprise. Uh, your, perhaps your preconception of who Jesus and his disciples were weren't necessarily you know, a group of guys who would get invited to parties a lot, especially great, wild celebrations like a Middle Eastern party. But Jesus was the type of guy who got invited to parties. He wasn't seen as over-serious he wasn't seen as, as being sort of too strict or dour. He was a, a joyful uh, person. And when, he was the type of guy when you thought, hey, we're going to throw a great party. There's going to be great food, great wine, great dancing, great music. Who should we invite? Oh, yeah, make sure Jesus is on that list because, you know, he's great at parties. Now, what, as you're trying to figure out who Jesus is, you know, holy, righteous, just, loving, gracious. As you're making up the list, put down, God invited to parties a lot. Because this isn't the only time. A lot of the Gospels is Jesus getting invited either to parties or to dinner or to banquets. He's the type of guy that people like to have around. So they invite Jesus to this great celebration, this wedding party, which is like the apex of all parties. A wedding party was the, you know, it's the creme de la creme of parties. Jesus' mother was there. His disciples were invited to the wedding as well. And when the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, they don't have any wine. Hmm. Okay, guys. I, I don't think it's possible for me to exaggerate just how epic a failure this would have been seen as. Imagine going to a wedding just here in England, America, or wherever you're tuning in from. Imagine going to a, you go to the wedding, and afterwards you're invited to the wedding dinner afterwards. 
and you know all the tables are laid out, you show up at the venue. Everyone sits down and there's an announcement. The caterers just decided to show up. There's no food. A shocking, you know, the, the bride and the groom, the parents, they, they'd all be embarrassed. They'd be, be ashamed. They hadn't done their homework and got like a, a proper caterer. And, and now everyone's here for the wedding dinner, after the wedding. And as they, take that sense of shock and shame and failure and multiply it by 10. In the ancient Near East, wine just wine isn't to wasn't to them what it is to us. For us, many of us enjoy wine. We enjoy a nice uh, glass of red with an appropriate dinner, especially if it's like red meat or bolognese or even pizza. You know, we we like a glass of wine. In the ancient Near East, wine was a symbol of happiness. They they didn't have a big choice of drinks. It wasn't like uh, you know you could get beer. Water, not a lot of people drank much water. Water was, you know, of questionable quality and it was, you know, better to ferment it into beer or wine. But, but wine was the drink of choice. There, was, there wasn't lemonade or, or any of these other drinks. It was, it was wine. And for daily use, for regular use, you knew, because a lot, most people didn't have much money, they would take the wine and then dilute it, mix it with a, a lot of water. But for, for really nice parties, like it, um, you know, at a wedding feast, you, then you just drink it straight. Then you just drink pure, undiluted wine when, when you wanted to party. And uh, so wine was everything. People were supposed to be drinking wine constantly for the whole of the week, like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They, they were just going to be constantly drinking lots of wine. That was, in Jewish culture, that was just seen as the appropriate time. That, that not because they were all alcoholics or drunks, that was just seen that at a, for a wedding week, that's what you do. You know, you drink a lot. Um, and, and so wine was everything. And they ran out of wine during the wedding. Now, it doesn't really say whether it happened, you know, at the beginning of the week or towards the end of the week. So we don't know if this is day one, two, three, four, five. You know, we, we don't know where they are. But it's somewhere in the middle of the celebrations, they have run out of wine. And this is unthinkable. It's unthinkable uh, for that time in the culture. This is, this is a horrid thing. And they live in a shame culture, um, which we're only beginning to get back to revert to here in the West. You know, we're very individualistic, or at least have a history of individualism. Uh, we get guilt. We know what guilt is like. But shame is, you know, other cultures, Eastern cultures, they talk about shame and honor. And, you know, that, that's not been a big part of our vocabulary for many generations. It's, it's kind of slowly beginning to come back in. You see it sometimes with a, like a great... Um, Hollywood celebrity or something, someone discovers a, something they tweeted from 10 years earlier or how when they were in high school they dressed up as uh, Aladdin or some ethnic minority for a, a, a party and, and you know these pictures resurface from 10, 20, 30 years ago and everyone's shocked and horrified and they get on social media and Twitter and just want to say, I'm so ashamed. I can't believe that was me. I want you to know that I'm not the same person I was back then. I'm sorry for all the people I've hurt. I need to take some time out to reflect. And I need to listen and learn. You know, and you know, people say these sort of uh, self-flagellating things on social media uh, to make up for any sort of embarrassing, non-politically correct stuff they said or did uh, when they were teenagers. Uh, as they resurface on social media. And you, you get that a lot with, you know, famous people. That doesn't happen to me. That doesn't happen to probably any of you watching this. Uh, but it does happen to uh, big celebrities. You know, stuff's drug out from their past and they're shamed on social media. And there's like this social media pile on um, for people who do things that, you know, aren't seen as, um, you know, fit in with all the, the latest um, uh, 21st century uh, ethics. You know, and these things are changing and being updated um, quite frequently. And so this is, this is happening a lot. We're slowly, we're getting a, a shame culture back in. But back then, like, everything was a shame culture. It, it was shame. If you, you did something, you said something, you would remember it for the rest of your life. And so this bride and this groom are facing a huge social stigma that will stick with them for years and years to come. People remember, oh, yeah. You were the bride and groom that did not have enough of the vino. 
you did not have enough of the red for your wedding. Oh, and you know, this will be a, a, a shame. They will not look back on their wedding week with joy and fondness like couples should, but instead they'll look back with shame. And so when Jesus' mother comes to him and says, they don't have any wine, she might as well have been saying, they've run out of happiness. They've run out of joy. Wine is joy. Wine is happiness. And they've run out. There's no more joy. There's no more happiness. Um, wine is a big symbol of joy and celebration. You know, as we've been saying all throughout the Bible, all throughout God's promises, I'll bless you with wine. And it says in the Psalms, and wine that makes glad the, the heart of humanity, that God gives wine as a gift uh, to be a, a source and symbol of joy. And that was seen that way all throughout the, the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, a uh, practical question, you know, why did Jesus' mother, why did Mary come and tell this to Jesus? Like, he's just beginning his ministry. He had just called his disciples. Up till now, he's, been, he's 30 years old. He's been swinging a hammer uh, he, at first with his adopted dad. And then we don't know exactly what happened to Joseph. Presumably, he, he died, passed away at some point. And then Jesus was working as a carpenter. And then he's, he's just begun going around preaching and teaching and calling his disciples. We don't have any record of, like, any miracles he's done yet. I mean, maybe he's done one, and it's just not been recorded. But somehow, Mary knows, I mean, Mary knows that Jesus is different, right? I mean, remember the whole virgin birth thing? The angel shows up, and, like, you know, she knows he's, he's not a typical guy. Yeah, she was there. She remembers that she was a virgin when she got pregnant. Uh, she remembers an angel showing up. But how much she knew about Jesus? Did she know what Jesus was supposed to do? Did she know what Jesus' life was supposed to signify? Did she have any idea that Jesus would one day die or rise from the again? Well, she probably had a few pieces of the puzzle. She probably had some ideas, but there's probably a lot she did not know. And yet she, she knew that this was a big deal. And in Jesus, if you can do anything, like... <sighs> This is big. Maybe, maybe Mary knew the bride and the the, um, the bride and the groom. Maybe she felt for them, and and she went and said, "Please, can you help? Can you help?" Jesus replies, kind of interesting. What has this concern of yours to do with me, woman? Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. Hmm. Okay couple of interesting things in there, a couple questions we have immediately. What, I mean, it's a bit brusque, like, it seems a bit, I don't know, dismissive. I, do you talk to your mom like this? Uh, what is this concern of yours to do with me, woman? Now, actually, a lot has been written about this. There, there's a ton that's written about this. Whether Jesus' use of the word woman here is sort of um, a bit, I don't know, cold, or is it endearing? Like, some people... There's some commentators out there who think that the use of the word woman is a bit like uh, here in English, maybe we would use the word lady. Like it would be kind of formal and polite, like anything for you, my lady. You know, ooh, that, that doesn't sound cold. That sounds kind of nice. And so some people think, well, Jesus is using the word woman, but in Greek, you know, maybe he was saying like, what does this have to do with me, my lady? You know, and there's, just a, there's a few people out there who speculate that, that Jesus isn't being cold, but... But I think the majority think that actually Jesus is being a bit firm, a bit cold, a bit distant. Um, now, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I, you got to do a lot of research on that Greek word that they have there for woman. And, and, and to be honest, I'm not 100% sure either way. But it, um, it's the next thing he says. He says, my hour has not yet come. Either way, whether he was saying a polite way or a cold way, he's, he's definitely drawing some sort of boundary. Okay, maybe he says in a polite tone of voice, maybe a rude voice, but it's what he's saying that we should pay attention to and is the focus of this sentence here. My hour has not yet come. Hmm. What's he talking about? Do you know? Do you, do you, do you, do you? We do know. We do know. Uh, we do know what John is referring to here. But all, th all throughout the Gospel of John, whenever Jesus refers to my hour, my coming hour, he's referring to his death. He's referring to his crucifixion. He's referring to the fact that he's going to end up on the cross. 
My hour, my hour has not yet come. Now, hmm, okay, that's what Jesus means. Jesus, he says, what, what is this concern of yours for the bride and groom? What does it have to do with me? My hour hasn't yet come. All right. Uh, it, I mean, it seems like a non sequitur, doesn't it? Like there's no logical connection. So we have to dig a little bit deeper here. They run out of wine. Jesus' mother goes to him and says, they've run out of wine. Do something. And, and Jesus says, what does that have to do with me? My hour's not yet come. Um, what is it about a wedding and being at a wedding that reminds Jesus of his death and the reason he is coming? There's a lot, really. See, Jesus in the Gospels is referred to sometimes as the bridegroom. Now, in Hebrew scriptures, this was a very meaningful term. Uh, throughout the scriptures, Yahweh, God, was seen as the bridegroom of Israel, that Israel was God's people, that he was their God. And, and throughout the, the scriptures, the prophets are very often referring to God as their, their bridegroom. And, and sometimes Israel is this uh, wonderful bride, and sometimes she's this unfaithful bride who commits adultery with other idols. And uh, so it's full of symbolism. And Jesus when he claims to be the bridegroom, he is taking a divine title. Now, we've already talked about this in John 1. You know, the word was God. He was in very nature God. And Jesus, by claiming to be the bridegroom, he, it, is, it is a divine. I am a bride, the bridegroom over the people of God. He is not just some created being. He is not just some angel. He's the bridegroom. Like no angel, no prophet, no apostle can claim that title. That is a unique title. For God himself. And so Jesus is at this wedding. And what's he doing? Well, I don't know, like most single people. Uh, you've probably been to weddings. What, 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 do you, what happens to young single people when they go to weddings? Young single people, they go to weddings, and the bride and the groom, the celebration, what are a lot of them thinking about? Well, most young single people, when they go to weddings, they're thinking about their own wedding. Their future wedding, how they might like to get married someday, or if and when they have a wedding, what it might look like, and this and this. So Jesus at this wedding, and the Bible, the scriptures climax. It, it climaxes Christian thought with a picture of a wedding. John, the same guy who writes this gospel, the Gospel of John, he writes another book called the Book of the Book of Revelation. It's the last book in the Bible. And how does Revelation end? How does John, the guy who's writing this, how, how does he end Revelation? He paints the end of human history as a wedding, as a great wedding party, where Jesus returns, he is united to his people, and there is this wedding. Uh, that may seem like, a, if you're new to Christian faith, that may seem like a new sort of metaphor or allegory to you, but it's this idea that each one fully gives themselves to the other, that God fully gives himself and reveals himself to his people, that we no longer live by faith, we live by sight, and the people of God fully belong to God and, and vice versa. It's that sort of intimate, together, covenant of, of holy belonging to one another between God and humanity. And so Jesus, he, he's thinking about his wedding. He's thinking about that day he's going to be united to humanity. And she says, she, she comes to Jesus and says, oh, shame, shame has just come upon uh, this, this wedding. There's no more joy. There's no more happiness. Can you do anything about this? Jesus knows that in order for him to get to his wedding day, that great day when he, he unites humanity with God in union forever, when he does that, this issue of shame needs to be dealt with. Shame is a big part of why Jesus came. Shame is a big reason that he went to the cross. He went to the cross to bear our shame. He, she, he's hearing this story of great shame that, that the young couple is about to experience, that they're going to be shamed. And, and Jesus, he's thinking about his own wedding, and he thinks, you know what? My hour has not yet come. I, I, I can't fully remove people's shame right now. I can't do it all the way, but, well, just watch. There is something he can do. Mother knows that Jesus, even though his hour has not yet come, he's still capable of doing things. And so she turns in verse 5. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. So Mary has confidence, you know, even though Jesus kind of 
He's a bit firm and seems to draw a boundary. He's like, I'm not sure I can do anything. She's like, right. You know, servants, do whatever he tells you to do. How many of you guys got mothers like this? You know, you try to draw a boundary, she steps right over it. <clears throat> okay, so, so do whatever he tells you. And he, maybe he rolls his eyes like, oh, mom. Okay, uh, do whatever he tells you. His mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, that's a great word for some of you. Servants, you know, if, you, if you're, as Christians, one of the things, we, way Christians see ourselves is we are servants of God. We belong to him. We are his. We are his people. We're his bride. We're his children. We're also his servants. And part of becoming a Christian is, is making him Lord. And we say, Jesus, we will do whatever you ask. Now, there are times when we don't understand Jesus. Where there are times when scripture may not make sense to us. But we don't have to understand in order to obey. Because listen, he says, now six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each container, each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. Okay. Let's remember the context here. Wedding party. They've run out of wine. Shock, horror, you know, going on behind the scenes. The servants are freaking out. Mary comes and says, hey, I've got a son and he's got skills. He's got like a real skills. And the servant's like, oh, okay, what is he like a, a winemaker? What, what's up? Is he a wine merchant? Does he, does he have some things? And so she gathers the servants together and says, do whatever he says. Like, all right, well, well, anything to, to rescue this party. And Jesus says, all right, guys, you, you see those religious uh, vessels out there, those ones that are used for, Jew, for purification, that, you know, you have to wash your hands and everything but before you go and celebrate in order to be holy and righteous and, and you know, really prepare yourself uh, to honor God and, and to be with people in a righteous way. And, uh, you know, those ceremonial religious jars, those huge things that contain 20 to 30 gallons each, and there's six of them. Yeah, yeah, we know, we know those jars. Okay, here's the plan. Here's how we're going to save, rescue the party. I want you to go and fill them with water. I'm sorry. Uh, what, did you, what did you say, Jesus? Like, I mean, um, yeah, I, I want you guys to go to the well with buckets and go back and forth between the well and these, you know, ceremonial jars and fill them with water. All the way up to the brim. Like, um, okay, Jesus, that's 180 gallons. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of carrying. That's, uh, that's heavy. She said, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Um, uh, aren't, we, aren't we supposed to be finding a way to get some wine for, I don't know, get some wine for the couple? Like, wouldn't that be sort of, um, I don't know. It, Jesus, I don't get it. Now, here's the thing. We don't get it a lot, do we? If Jesus is who he claims to be, now just think about it. Jesus is who he claims to be. If he really is the Son of God, come down from heaven to earth. If he really is in very nature God, what are the chances that you are going to perfectly understand all of his commands. Hmm? Are, are you? Think, think about it, for, especially for those of you who are parents. Maybe you're a 35-year-old dad and, and you got a five-year-old kid. How often do you give instructions to your five-year-old kid and what is your five-year-old saying? Why? Why? Well, you know, sometimes you can explain to your five-year-old why. But other times it's kind of complicated and you're like, well, you just have to do it because I said to do it. And you might not understand why you can't eat ice cream all day for every meal. Um, you know, you, your knowledge of how proteins and carbohydrates and fats and sugars and tooth decay, you don't really understand how that works now. So you're just going to have to take my word for it. Now, if we see that in human terms between the generations, how much more between an infinite eternal God and us as humans? There'll be times when Jesus asks us to do things, when we follow things in scripture that we don't fully understand, that, don't, that doesn't make sense to us. I get this with my kids sometimes. I'm like, listen, I need you to do this. And you do too. I know all parents do. I'm not knocking my kids because every kid is like this. I did this to my parents. If my mom or dad is watching this right now, they'll verify I was the same one. It's just it's almost universal, isn't it? At some point, whether they're 5 or 10 or 15 years old, 
You ask your kids to do something, and what are they going to say? Well, why do I have to do that? And you're like, well, um, you know, because I told you to. You know, I mean, I could try to explain why, but it's complicated, and sometimes I just know best. You can't, you can't see, well, why do I have to do biology? You know, I want to be uh, a baseball player or a football player, or I want to be, you know, um, a YouTube star or a singer or a dancer or a TikTok star, whatever. I'm going to be that when I grow up, so I'm not going to need biology. Why do I have to do my biology? And you're just like, all right, because I said so. You, you need to do your biology homework. Right, but why? And you're like, well, I'm not going to do it if I don't understand. Well, here's the thing. Obedience is really only obedience. It, obedience only gets tested when you do and you don't understand. You know, I'm maybe not explaining that well. If you only ever obey when you understand and it makes sense to you, then you're really not talking about obedience. You're talking about agreement. And those are two separate things. When we come to God and have an obedient heart, we do whatever he asks, whether we think it's a good idea or not, whether we understand or not, whether we agree or not. Now, we're talking about obedience to God. I'm not talking about obedience to the government or some human authority or even your pastor or anything like this. I'm, I'm just talking about this. This is the sort of authority that God has over us, that Jesus has over us, that we follow him and obey him in his work, like even when it does not make sense. Okay? Can, can we just think that he may have a bigger perspective and a bigger understanding than we do? Just like a parent speaking to their five-year-old. And so Mary says, do whatever they tell you. And so Jesus then gives them a command that makes zero sense. Zero. Z none. Nothing. There, there is nothing logical, reasonable. These, these servants aren't dumb. These servants have been around a while. They understand that when a party runs out of wine, filling up pitchers for religious purposes does absolutely nothing to save the party. They're not... They're not foolish. Jesus is giving them something new that seems so foolish. Embarrassing. And can you imagine people asking, hey, what, what are you guys filling up all the jars for? I don't really think we're going to need all that water for religious uh, washing. I mean, most of the guests are here. They've already washed their hands. Like, you really need to fill that up? <laughs> yeah. Why? Uh, one of the guests asks us to. Uh, oh, okay. And maybe it was embarrassing. Maybe people asked them what they were doing. They had to make up other excuses. Whatever. But they obeyed. Fill the waters, fill them with water. And so they filled to the brim, and then he said, Now draw some out and take some to the chief servant. And they did. And when the chief servant tasted the water, uh, after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants had drawn the water new. And he called the groom and told him, Everyone sets out the fine wine first. Then, after people have drunk freely, the inferior. But you have kept the fine wine until now. Jesus tells them, I want you to pour it in a cup. You know, they didn't have glasses back then. They, they didn't do wine in these little Frenchy sort of glasses. They, they, it was in a cup, maybe a wooden cup. And... He said, take it to, here it says the chief servant. It's, it's like, um, I don't know if that's a great term for it. Like the, it was like the master of ceremonies. In today's culture, it would be like, you know, how the best man kind of helps run things. And is the guy in charge of the festivities, the MC, the, the lord of the feast, if you will. You know? Very important, very important guy for the, for the whole week. And they bring him the wine. Now, do, did, did the servants even know it had turned into wine at this point? Like, when did the servants get what had happened? I'm not sure when. They, the servants may not have caught on with what was happening until the chief servant drunk and was like, man, this is good wine. And all the servants look at each other and be like, huh? <laughs> I'm sorry, what did you just say? Yeah, it's really great wine. And then they look in the cup and all of a sudden it's red. Maybe they didn't know till that point. We're not sure. Maybe they, they saw while they were carrying it. But as far as we know, they didn't know until the guy said so. And he pulls the groom over. You know, the groom, you know, ultimately he was the one paying for all this. 
And he said, I'm really amazed. You know, this, has been going, this party's been going on for a couple days. Most of the guests have had quite a bit to drink, and they're a bit tipsy at the very least. And, you know, normally you put out the best wine first when people are totally sober and their palates are more refined and they can tell a good wine from a bad wine. And after a couple of days, then you bring out the cheap stuff and no one notices by then. But this, this is really good. You've been holding up. This is a very nice Chianti. This is a nice Shiraz. This is, mmm, you know, the bouquet, you know, all the, all the rest, you know. He's, he's, he's going to town. He's loving this wine. He says, you have saved the best for last. And the groom's like, I did. <laughs> the groom, and he's like, oh, uh, that's great. You know, how much did the groom even know? But it says this, the servants knew. There will be some things about God that you will never learn until you have a servant's heart. Listen, there's some things about God, of course, you can kind of learn in books by studying theology. There are some things you can learn by tuning in and watching from home or coming here to church. Uh, you know, we have people here in, in Fairfield today. Um, there are things you can learn, um, very much so, by studying um, or by coming to church or things. And yet there are so many things you will totally miss out on. You will not see the miracles. You will not see the glory unless you have a servant's heart. Unless you get to the place where you say, Jesus, I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll do what you want me to do, even if it doesn't make sense or seem silly at times. And when you do, when that's your heart, and when you begin to serve in that way and follow him, you, you're going to learn things about God that you never just learn from academia, from Christian academia, or from sermons or books or anything like this. The servants were the only ones who really understood what was happening. It says, Jesus perform, performed this first sign in Cana of Galilee. He displayed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. John says that this was his first sign. Now, a sign is um, it's a little different than just a miracle. It's a miracle with a meaning. Now, when Jesus went on earth, in, in a sense, all of his miracles were signs in that they weren't simply raw displays of power. Like, Jesus didn't just show up and just do miracles in order to get people to believe in him. Hey, look, I can turn this, uh, you know, this child into a goat. Or, you know, hey, look at this, I can, I can fly. Or, you know, um, they, they were never raw displays of power. They were acts of compassion and care and the love of the Father. He's, the, he's expressing the love of the Father to humanity. Uh, a divine compassion, an empowered compassion. And particularly when it uses the word sign, it means there's a message. It's, sim it's symbolic. It's a symbolic miracle. And when John uses this term signs, they were like, okay, this is a symbolic miracle. Well, what is, what's it a symbol of? What's it a symbol of? Well, we've already touched on it a bit, haven't we? Throughout the Hebrew scriptures and in this culture, wine is, is associated with joy. And they have run out of wine. They have run out of joy. They have run out of happiness. And Jesus comes and restores this. What is it you're looking to for happiness right now? A new friend? A new video game system? A new car? A new house? A new spouse? A new career? More money? What are you looking to for happiness? Now, I don't want to bash the sorts of happiness and joy that we experience here in the world. A nice meal with a friend, a glass of wine. These are, these are great gifts from God. Like, there, there's so many good things in this world for us to enjoy. And yet, if we look to any of these created things to satisfy that deep longing in our heart, well, maybe they will for a little while, but eventually they will run out. All created joys and happinesses, they they eventually run out. You run out of wine. If you don't have Jesus in your life, you, you, eventually you run out of wine. That marriage can only satisfy for so long. That, those academic degrees can only satisfy for so long. Those job promotions can only satisfy for so long. Those children, the, whatever, they can only satisfy for so long. Eventually you run out of wine. You run out of joy, you run out of happiness, and, and life, you know, we, we as a society, we have more money and more stuff than we know what to do with. And yet so few people know a deep, rich 
joy. And Jesus, he, he just shows up at the scene and he shows up and he, and he brings joy to these people. And he does it, you know, another part of the, if we're, you know, this, we're, John tells us this is a sign, so well, let's look at the symbolism here. How does he produce it? He tells them to fill up these religious jars that were used for purification. Why did he do that? Well, these jars were supposed to remove shame from people, right? This is kind of how they dealt with shame. And of course, we in our culture, we have ways that when people feel ashamed, you know, they sometimes offer public apologies or, you know, they do the whatever, what, you know, they, they can do to try to atone for this. And what Jesus is saying is, listen, water in a jar can never really take away human shame. Now, shame and guilt are synonymous, but they're a little different. Guilt is usually like about a specific deed, and shame is more a general sense of who I am. I'm, I'm inferior. I'm inadequate. I'm bad. You know, I'm, um, you know it's, it's, a, it's a little more vague, and it's often in relation to other people and not just before God. And, but guilt and shame... Um, Jesus says, listen, the, the, the water in there that people would wash their hands as a symbol of what they were wanting God to do, I'm the reality. I've come to bring the reality that, that all those rituals, all those other things pointed to, all those other ways you deal with shame, all those other ways you deal with your guilt, um, all those ways you feel of not being good enough or smart enough or pretty enough or, or successful enough or rich enough or whatever, I've come to wash that away. I've come to do that. He takes the cup and brings it to the Lord of the table in a cup. Well, you know, the only other time we're, we encounter this symbol, this picture of a cup, is when Jesus is himself the Lord of the banquet. And it's right before his death, and he takes a cup of wine once again. He drinks of it and gives it to others, and he says, This wine is my blood, which is going to be shed for the new covenant. See, Jesus comes to bring joy, but it's at its own cost. He knows that his hour is approaching. See, Jesus wants joy. Jesus wants a bride, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to come at a cost to him. His wine is going to be shed so that we can drink of his wine. His joy is going to be lost in suffering. He, he empties himself of joy and embraces suffering, and then we can drink that joy. We take up the, the cup and we do that, you know, weekly at communion when we, we drink uh, that, um, you know, we tend to use we, juice and, instead of wine, though maybe one day in the future we'll uh, have both or uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see some churches use wine, some use juice. But it's the same idea. It's a symbol for something. Um, that, this is, that this is pointing to joy and happiness but it, it, he was emptied of it. He, he, he was emptied of his blood. He was emptied of his joy. And he suffered so we could drink the joy and the life that he brings. And this is how, this was a sign. This is how he displayed his glory. And his disciples began to believe in him. And this is good news. It, this is, Jesus is so amazing that this would be his first sign. He shows up at a party. It's in chaos. They're about to be ashamed. And what does Jesus do? He removes the shame. He does a miracle, which seems very irreligious. I mean, hey, let's fill up, you know, let's fill up the church, uh, you know, coffee urns and just turn it into whiskey. Woo! You know, it, it almost seems a bit disrespectful. Like, Jesus, are you supposed to be turning religious uh, pots into wine? And yet he does it. And yet... It's this great act of joy and happiness and party and celebration that's pointing us to a greater party. It's pointing us to a greater marriage, that this is our future. Listen, sometimes life is hard. Some of you are going through difficult times right now, and it's hard. And Jesus says, have a little sip of my wine. Have it, let, me, let me impart some joy to your soul. Let me impart some happiness there. As you look forward to the great day of celebration, one day we will meet face to face. I will be wholly yours. You will be wholly mine. I will make everything sad come untrue. There will be no more shame, no more sorrow. Think upon that day. Hold on to my promises. Sit my promises as if they were wine. And one day what you know by faith, the happiness and the joy that you know by faith right now, 
One day you will know that happiness and joy by sight. And it will be rich and it will be wonderful. Guys, come and partake of the goodness and the beauty of God. <laughs> if, if you don't know much about this joy, well, why do Christians sing? Why, why is it typically when we get together we sing? Now, I know with the lockdown restrictions, we're not really supposed to sing here in the chapel when we gather. But well, why do we get together and sing? Like we've had three pints and we're at a football game. Imagine we show, why do we do that? Because we're celebrating the party of all parties. We're celebrating the bridegroom of all bridegrooms. The celebrate, like it's coming and we're looking forward to that. And churches are supposed to be a place of great celebration because there's, there's infinite beauty coming. There's infinite happiness coming. And we're looking forward to it. And we give thanks for created joys. We give thanks for, you know, uh, marriage and food and sex and alcohol and uh, nice walks on the beach and, and everything else like that that God enriches creation with. But you know what? As nice as they are, on their own, Eventually they run out and they point to something so much greater. They point to a relationship with a, a bridegroom God and the happiness he gives will absolutely never run out. He shares it with us who are naturally shameful creatures, but he removes our shame at great cost to himself. And this is the good news. Your shame has been dealt with. Your guilt has been dealt with. You may have lived the most shameful life in all of Royston. Okay, You, you may have lived a very shameful life. Jesus has taken care of that. He has shed his own blood and he has suffered in order to give you joy and invite you to the party. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would touch every heart and that you would bring joy to every person who's broken by shame and by guilt. Amen. All right, guys. Be blessed. See you next week.
our service is over now, shall we close by saying the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Great. Thank you very much for coming. Great to see you all. Um, there's still time to go around to the uh, garden around there and, and have fellowship together. So, not see you next week. <laughs>